So, ladies and gentlemen, I left you last time with uh, a model uh, that was a coupled system. Um, we had seen a coupled system last time uh, in this form. What, does anyone recognize this model on the board here? This is a set of differential equations, but it characterizes in skeletal form, in kind of this minimalist form, one of the models that we had yesterday that I argued was kind of a minimalist coupled model. What model was that? x dot equals minus x over 1, y dot equals x minus y over 2. What was that? Yeah, it's a coupled system, and, and that's exactly right, because why do I say it's coupled? What, what, what's sort of the hallmark of coupling here? How do I know it's, it's a coupled system? Because change in x also depends on change in y. Good, or, or I would argue, so, th so does change in x depend on change no, in y? Change in y. Depends. Change in y depends on change, change not only in y, but in x. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's coupled. You've got y's evolution linked to and dependent on the evolution not only of its state but of, of itself but of, of x, right? Um, and if I were to draw this up, what does it look like stock and flow was? Can we? Okay, so x as a flow going out, good. And when, uh, whither does that flow go? Going to y. Going to y. Going to y, okay, so, okay, this is going to y, and y, flow, out. flow in and flow out, right? Um, where does the flow out go? Well, it just goes, no, it goes externally. Okay, so um, uh, that's that system on the board, okay? Um, it's coupled nominally. Um, we're going to return to this issue. It's not inherently coupled because it's a linear system. We can decouple it, it turns out. And we're going to come back to that issue in spades, um, uh, either late today or, or tomorrow. Um, but it's nominally coupled. It, it looks coupled, right? Y depends not only itself. The evolution of Y depends not only of itself, but of X. In general, for dynamic systems, the evolution of the system depends on its state. And as we see here, the evolution of a given component of that system, a coupled system, its evolution will depend on the broader state of the system, not just on its own, you know, that element. Okay? We okay with that? Okay, now I'm gonna show you this other model. And and this model, how is it different from that one? I argued it in the closing minutes last time. Nominally, it looks like pretty much the same thing, right? Here's y dot equals x of t minus y of, well, here it's of, of t. It could be y of t minus 2, you know, just as easily. But what's different about this? Both state variables are dependent on the degree. Good, yeah. So x depends not on itself, but on y. Whereas here, the evolution of x depends on what? X. x. Yeah. So, so we have something with two state variables, but it's and it's coupled nominally, but it's it's um, coupled in it with a different wiring. X depends on y, and y depends on on uh, uh, x and and y. And the behavior of this will be quite different. The one above. The one above was this one, right? It was a second order delay, uh, example 1b. And I'm gonna call it up here uh, visually in a stock and flow model so we can, we can look at it. It's example 1b, okay? Um, that was this one, and do you remember what happened? So which is the red line here? The red line is which one? X, because X. X. X just, how do you know it's, that's X, looking at it? It just what? Changing yeah, yeah, and how is it changing? It's decaying in a first order way. It's decaying exponentially. Why, by contrast, why is it going up originally? 
Yeah, because you have inflow into it. It starts zero. The inflow is greater than the outflow. It rises, and then it starts to decay according to its outflow. We'll come back to this point, but you'll notice that Y's evolution here, actually, it's kind of like different parts of the system are driving it mostly at different times. During this phase, prior to about two, it's driven mostly by the inflow. And then the outflow is sort of dominant in that later phase. Of course, it's the balance between the two that's so important. Okay, so that was last time. This new one is going to have a rather different look to it. It's going to be this. Okay, and I'd like to explicate it. So the one we saw last time was, was this one, uh, one, uh, one B, and I'm going to go open it before we come to this, to this next one, okay? Here we go. Um, so one B, uh, one B. Hey, where's one B? Um, I think it's, oh, no, oh, oh boy. Uh, I, I, I had it there this morning, but it's, it, it's looking like it's, um, I, I must have done something to, to overwrite it. That's, uh, that's a bummer. Ah, okay, this, this looks basically like it. Um, okay, so we had uh, X and Y. That was our one last time, right? Flow and, and annual birth flow is zero. Okay, now we're going to be going to a different one. And I want to walk you through this because it's, it's actually a really useful exercise to think through. It's this one here, okay? And it has to do with actual values and perceived values. It's a good way to think about it. But to bring this back to you, I want to go look at um, something that we discussed within 394.858 briefly. So we've been dealing with basically a lot of first order delays here. That's the lower part. These are our building blocks. We have first order delay defined by the fact that we have a state x a single state variable and we have a change in that state variable that's linear dependent on x right so it's in this case x divided by some delay or x times some rate of flow right happy and here we'll, we may have an inflow one way to view first order delays is in exactly this way okay so you may have an inflow you have an outflow whose value is linearly dependent on on that the value of that state variable and it makes sense, right? If, if there's no people in the hospital, there's gonna be no one leaving the hospital per hour, you know, going forward. By contrast, if there's a thousand people in the hospital, there's gonna be quite a few people leaving per hour in general. And so it makes sense the outflow from the stock depends on the value of the stock, right? Without anyone in the stock, no one's going to leave. If there's lots of people in the stock, more people are going to leave. So it, it kind of jibes with our intuition how systems work, that outflows depend on the state. The value of an outflow depends on the state um, associated with what it's leaving, the stock which it's leaving, right? Do you see that? Because, I mean, imagine if this outflow didn't depend on x, if it was just some fixed number, X is gonna potentially go to minus infinity, right? I mean, it will just go forever and it will just be drained. So when we have conserved quantities, physical quantities, the outflow has to depend on, on the inflow at some level, okay? But I wanna take this basic model and I wanna flip it around and use it in another way, a way that's actually quite important for human decision making. And that's this top one. This features in quite a few behavioral models in the system dynamics field, particularly. So that's this top one. I will tell you that same exact system, same exact mathematics, can be characterized at the top. Same ODEs, different way of depicting it in the language of stock and flows to lend a, a deeper understanding of what it means. Harking back to this difference between those two structural perspectives, okay? Um, <clears throat> so here we have a, we have a stock. I, I wanted to call it X, but if I have them in the same model, it doesn't allow me to do it. So I call it X2, but it basically for all intents and purposes, it's just like X in this other formulation. And here we have a target, okay? We have a target value, and the value of the flow is given by a gap 
between this target value and the current value of the stock. And the idea is, look, if the target is above the value of the stock, is the inflow positive or negative? This is the formula here. Is that if the value of the target is above that of the stock, is the, is the flow into the stock positive or negative? Positive. If the target is above the actual value of the stock, the inflow will be negative. And given that there's no outflow here, what would that lead the stock to do over time? The inflow is positive. What's the stock value of the stock going to do over time? It's going to rise. It's going to increase, right? It would bring it closer to the target, right? Um, if the target is far above the stock, the value of the stock will rise faster than if the value of the target is just a little bit above the stock, right? It's this gap between the target and the stock that dictates how quickly the stock increases, right? If the stock is hugely above, excuse me, the, the target is hugely above the stock, the inflow will be huge. It'll be, well, huge divided by delay. Right? And, and so the value of the stock will go up more quickly than if the target is just a little bit above x2, right? Where it will go up slowly, right? So x will follow the target upwards. How if the target is below the stock, the value of the stock? What will happen then? So if target is less than the value of the stock, what's going to happen? Yeah, it can be negative. So Even if it's an inflow? It's oh, yeah. Negative. Sure. Mm -hmm. it can reverse them. So it'll, it'll just tend back towards... Yeah, the it'll go... The target. It'll go towards the target. It'll just... The, if the target's below the stock, then x target minus x2 will be negative, right? If the, if the target is 1,000 and the stock is 2,000, the target... 1,000 minus the value of the stock, 2,000, will yield a, quote, uh, a quantity of minus 1,000 divided by the delay. And so the value, so it'll have a negative flow into the stock, meaning that the stock will be reduced in value. It'll go down in value. Remember, a flow is, the value of a flow is just telling you how, how quickly the the stock is changing with respect to that particular you know, driver, right? If, if that's the only inflow, it actually gives you the derivative of the stock. And so a negative value of the flow tells you the stock is going yeah. down. <laughs> Thank you, Wade. Um, so if X target is a ton, if the stock is far, far greater than X target, the, value, the flow will be hugely negative, and so the stock will go down very quickly, right? If the value of target is just a little bit below the value of the stock, this gap, X target minus X2, will be small, but it'll be negative, and so the stock will go, the value of the flow will be negative, but small, and so the stock will go down, but slower, right? It's the rate of change of the stock, positive or negative, right? Does that make sense? In either case, it will get closer to the target. So here, the value of X is going to follow the target. Does that make sense? OK. Um, and I'm arguing that the mathematics for this is the same as the one below. Well, that may not seem obvious, but let's, let's write it out, right? Write it out, okay. So, so let's go write our ODE, ODEs here, okay? Um, uh, here we go. Okay, so these are, let's write the, the top one well, let's, yeah, sure. Let's write the, the top one first. So give me the formula. I'm going to write it as x, OK? It says x2, but I'm going to write it as x. So give me the OD for that. 
but to me it's this state equation, just like that. Okay, I'm going to drop the square brackets because there's only one formula right now. There's only one state variable. So what is it? What's on the left side? Oh, come on, folks. What's on the left side? X dot. X dot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, X dot equals what? Formula. The formula. Yes, the formula. And I'm going to write it as, as target minus X over some delay tau. Okay. By the way, I'm going to be adding to that document a thesis and papers. I, I really wanted to do it this morning, but I didn't have time. Um, a, a large table listing for different symbols. What are they used for? There's a there's kind of codified but unwritten rules for how you use different symbols. Like symbols mean certain things intuitively to people. And if you do something weird like use K for a real number, it'll just be bizarre for people. You use K for an index or a, a, an integer. Um, and you know you use tau for a time constant and, and mu for a mean time, et cetera, or a mean um, of some quantity. So I, I'm going to put that in there. Anyway. This is a formula for the top one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the ultimate equilibrium for that? I, I, what's the equilibrium value for x for this? Yeah, it's the target. That is, by definition, the equilibrium is the value of the state at which the system is in balance or is at rest, right? And the value. That value is given by x dot equals zero. What is the x for which x dot equals zero? It's x equals what? Target, right? Yeah, x equal target, x dot equals target minus x. X is you know divide, all divide, quantity divided by, by tau. And if x is target, target minus x is zero. And so x dot will equal to zero, which is the definition of equilibrium, right? Right? Okay, so the equilibrium value of this is x equals target. Okay, now let's talk about the negative, the, the lower one. That lower one there, right? Give me, so that's the upper one. Um, and now let's, let's, let's go through the lower one. Could anyone give me the, uh, the formula for the lower one? Let's just write that down. Give me the OD. X dot equals. Good. X dot equals. Good. 10. Okay. Minus X over delay. Okay. X over delay. Good. I'll, I will write delay as tau. Okay. Um, excellent. And what I'm telling you is. These things are the same as long as target has a certain relationship to the actual steady state of that. So give me the steady state value, in other words, the equilibrium value of that lower one. At what point will x dot for this lower one, the, the one we've written right now, be at rest? At what point will it be in balance? At what point will x dot equal zero? Well, x dot equals zero here would apply what? X over tau equals 10. Yeah, implies, and I'll, I'll, I have a bit of space to spare, so I'll move that over. X uh, implies 10 minus x over tau equals zero, right? The inflow equals the outflow, right? Uh, right? It's, it's in balance. Um, uh, and so let me, let me make that clear. 10 minus x over tau equals zero, right? And so what does this imply? We can kind of move this one over to the right, and we could flip it around. And what do you get? X equals 10 tau, right? Right? That's the equilibrium value at which this occurs, right? Maybe I'll write x star. Okay, that's like the equilibrium value here. Okay? 10 
No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I argue that these are fundamentally the same, the same thing if you set target above to be a certain value. And what is that value? You see it for a particular case on the screen. But in general, what is that value? If we set target equal to some particular thing, these two will be identical. Let's, let's choose target cleverly. 10 tau. 10 tau. So I'm saying these will be equivalent if target equals 10 tau. So, so let's, let's, let's reason it through, right? Um, so if target equals 10 tau, then we have, what's, what's the right-hand side? If target equals 10 tau, then, then what is the case? What is this? 10 minus x over tau. Good. 10. So, so uh, target is 10 tau minus x over tau, which is equal to 10 minus x over tau. And does that look familiar? Yeah, it's exactly this thing, right? It's precisely that. So, so if target, if the target is the equilibrium value, or given that this goes towards the target, if, if the target is, is the, the same, at, or if the inflow is the target divided by tau, right? Um, then, um, then you're, you're in, uh, in fine, fine shape, right? Um, so, uh, so here, the inflow, right? Um, uh, the inflow value is, is 10, and, and uh, tau is 2, uh, excuse me, 20. It's 20, yeah, formula 20. Um, so as long as the inflow is equal to the target divided by tau, that's 200 divided by 20. That's the inflow, right? These are interchangeable. These are two ways to look at the system. Um, we could describe it at one or the other just by picking our, our, our units. We just have to pick the right tau. If we have this bottom one for some particular inflow, we can turn it into the above one by choosing a target that's simply that inflow times the value of the delay. In this case, 20. Does that make sense? Given the bottom one, I can always get the top one. And given the top one, I can always get the bottom one by taking the target, dividing it by tau, and using that as the rate of inflow. They're interchangeable. Do you see that? These are two different ways of understanding the system. But of course, the top one has a kind of different notion associated with it at an intuitive level we ascribe it target following properties. It's like it's trying to follow this target over time. It's adjusting the, the state of the system to come towards that target, approach that target, achieve that target. We, we don't normally, often we don't think of, that, of it in that way for the bottom one, where we think of it as kind of, um, the outflow is the delayed version of the inflow here. So, Levy, yes. Sorry, so if I think of that, so then say the top one, say if we just characterize the system like by the top one, yeah. then the flow, we can have both negative or positive. Uh, positive value. That's right. But if I look at the picture at the second one, mm -hmm. then the inflow in the second one would, should never be negative then? Uh, well, the inflow in the second one is fixed. It's, it's defined as anything. And you could actually have, um, you know, a, a negative flow. There's, there's nothing that would prevent you from, from having a negative flow. Now, if, if you were to have a negative flow, it corresponds to a target that's negative, right? Because the delay is always going to be positive. And the target is just the delay tau times this inflow. Um, so you can actually have, I mean, it, it is meaningful to talk about an inflow that's negative. Um, uh, it's, it's not as common because we're often dealing with quantities where there's no negative, but you could think of it associated with movement, for example, in a certain direction. If we declare this version of the class is positive and this direction is negative, 
you know, if I'm moving this way at a certain rate, we could describe that as negative movement, right? Um, yeah? So it's, there's nothing that odd about that um, uh, in certain contexts, okay? Or if we think of these as costs, you know, positive is like revenue and negative is like cost accruing, you know, uh, obligations occurring, liabilities occurring. A negative inflow could mean I have liabilities accruing. A positive inflow could be I have revenues accruing and one cancels out the other. So there, there are many contexts in which you can have a neg, it can be useful to deal in terms of negative quantities. But there's other contexts like people, you don't, you know, you know we, we talk, there are some negative people around, but we don't mean in that sense, right? Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is, these are two different ways to view the system. And one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm describing here is it's useful to be able to look at this just like with matrix multiplication. I presented four different ways of understanding it, you know, um, in terms of the weighted sum of the columns or in terms of thinking about it as operating on vectors or ways of thinking about it in terms of, uh, you know, dot product with rows. Here, the same basic mathematics has two different lenses by which we can understand it. And often it's useful to shift from one to the other for different circumstances. So this top one, we think of the system as following some, some, some value, some what will be the equilibrium value for the stock. The bottom one, we think of the outflow as following the inflow. Does the bottom one go to an equilibrium? You bet it does. It's just, it's a kind of, we might think of it as a composite equilibrium. It's the inflow times the delay, rather than being obvious. But the, the, the value of the stock here chases, it's true, it, it approaches the value of the inflow times, times delay. So let's experiment with that, just phenomenologically. Let's, let's, let's try one of these top ones, if, if we can, okay? Anyone oppose? Here no, hearing no objections. Um, so I'm just gonna create, what the heck? Here we go, ready? Okay, here we go. So I have a value of X and then I have a, a single flow in, right? Change in X, right? Um, and I'm gonna have a target, right? And I'm gonna be pedantic about it. Pedantic for a reason because these things mean something to us. Gap between target and X, right? Um, and here's my target. The gap between it is going to be what? You tell me. What's the formula for the gap between it? Yeah, target minus X. Should it be X minus target or target minus X? Yeah, because we want positive inflow if the target is bigger than x, because the x has to increase. Does that make sense? Okay, let's, let's look at this. Okay, so we're going to have a target, and I'm going to set it, what the heck, you know, 200, right? Okay, sure. Um, and here, it's going to be, I'm going to have a delay, right? Um, and we're going to to feed that in to this, and we're gonna have this. So this is what it's going to be. I'm gonna have an initial value, let's say, of zero, let's say, okay? Um, and the change in X will just be anyone? What's the change in X here? Change in X is just going to be the, what is this? Yeah, this is the gap, x target minus x2. I'm just spelling it out more explicitly, divided by the delay, okay? So it's gonna be the gap divided by the delay. You notice all that gets sort of collapsed down into one equation here, but I'm telling you it's, it's useful to think of it in terms of gap. From a software engineering perspective, I like thinking about there as a gap, and this is part of the language of stocks and flows or these declarative representations that moves beyond the sort of collapsed assembly language of ODEs, okay? Um, and then it's gonna be divided by the delay, right? Um, so there's a, 
there's a gap, but it takes us some time to um, uh, to to you know get that. So the delay here is going to be 20, right? And the change in x is just the gap between that. Okay, so if I run this, right, um, uh, there we go. So I have this target, right? And if I move the target, this is going to go up and down here. The value of x will approach the, the target, okay? It'll approach it over time, right? Um, and in, Venn's, in any logic, you could actually run it out over time and, and um, and then adjust it and it will follow the new value, et cetera. So you could actually see it um, in, uh, in sort of uh, over, over time. So, so we'll call this, uh, uh, you know, target following, following first order delay, okay? Um, so its job in life is to change X to narrow this gap and in short, to, to follow target. It tries to move X to follow the target. But I say that this is exactly the same system as this bottom one. It's the same system. It's just viewing it from a different lens. It's viewing it from the lens of following a target. The bottom one is viewing it from the lens of the outflow adjusts to, wants to be near, equal to the inflow. Do you understand that? The bottom one, it, it wants the outflow to be, to match the inflow. And and uh, and that's the value at which x is at rest, right? Um, and it's going to be adjusting, and x adjusts to make the outflow equal to the inflow. That's how we think about it. Okay, two different lenses. Now, why you may wonder why am I introducing this having to do with our system, our system back here? because this is everything to do with understanding that system. So let's go on to this next slide. Here we go. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a version of what we just saw with a twist. So here, you could think of this as someone is, is adjusting you know, how much they raise, how quickly they raise the value of X or how, how quickly they decrease it to follow target, right? They know what the value of X is, they see target is above it, and so they move it faster upwards. They try to move it faster, um, uh, you know, to, according to the limitations of the delay, or they move it down. But often in the world, we don't see X directly. What we see is a what we perceive as a, is, is a delayed version of X, or a, it's, it's a slightly outdated version of X. We see what X was you know, a moment ago, and, we're, and we're, our actions are based on what we saw a short time ago, which is not X now, but X as it was then. Okay? So in short, there's often a, a delay associated with perception. And the way in which we capture this in many behavioral models for system dynamics and indeed for hybrid modeling um, is as following. So here, the top one will look very similar to what we just saw. There's a target and I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna actually show you uh, a model where this is slightly explicated better. I, I, I kind of like it better. It's one I made this morning, it's this one. Okay, the top one, both top and bottom should remind you of something. What do these look like? Top and bottom, what are, what are those? Yeah, they're, they're like first order delays, target following first order delays. But there's a twist. Where is the twist? Why are these not just solitudes as first order delays, where the first is just following its target and the second is following its target? There's, there's an important difference. The targets are moving. Sorry? Okay, there is a... X, X doesn't impact itself directly, but goes through Y and comes back. Yeah, exactly. So up here at the top one, there's a target, and it undertakes change to try to bring the situation closer to the target. It tends to move upwards. If the target is above, it's 
perception. And it tends to move downwards if the target is below its perception. But it's operating and judging the gap between what is and what it wants. What it wants is target and what it what it what it it, it has it thinks is the perception. Um, it's it's actually using not the actual value of x as it is now, but but the perceived value. And I should really to to lower this, I'm going to say gap between target uh, and perceived value, just so you you see that. So here we're we're making adjustments. We're ramping up, for example, if the target is above our perception of the value, not the value itself. Okay, we don't have privileged access to x, the true value of the situation. We have access to a delayed version of it. Maybe it was the number of, you know, the number of people who got sick yesterday, or maybe it was, you know, we're trying to dictate discharge policies based on the number of people in the emergency room as it was 15 minutes ago or something like that. It's a slightly outdated version of the situation. And we're trying to judge, okay, look, how far is our target situation above that, that perceived value? And uh, based on that, to undertake change that will bring us closer. But that change is undertaken on the actual value. And it takes time for the actual value to be perceived. Okay? So here, we have a perception. And this perception, let's ignore the top part for the moment. This perception is based on a difference between some target in our perceived value. Our perceived value adjusts to follow what? To follow the Yeah, our perception adjusts, our perceived value adjusts to follow the actual value. We, there's some actual value in the world we don't have privileged access to, but we have some perception of the value, and at some point we notice you know, gaps between the two when we adjust our perception of the situation. So there's a gap between our perception of the situation and what, we, what actually is the case, and that causes us to re-examine our perception and adjust it to be closer to the actual situation according to some perception delay. Maybe that perception delay is 15 minutes on average for the emergency room. Or maybe it's, um, you know, for public health campaigns associated with, uh, you know, something like uh, vaping, maybe it's a perception over the period of quarters, three-month period. But we have some perception delay based on delayed reporting and based on the fact that it, it takes time to collect information and, and summarize it, and, uh, and it takes time to adjust our mental models. So our perception is often lagging the original situation according to some perception delay. But if the actual value goes in a certain direction, our perception will follow it just in a delayed version, right? So this follows the actual value, but with a delay. Do you see that? This perceived value, this is just our target follower. It just fall our perceived value is following the actual value as its target, just with a delay. It's the same thing we saw here, but excuse me, here, um, but where the target is not some exogenous thing. It's it's the actual value of the situation. So think about it as, you know, you're steering a car on ice. You have some perception of where the car was, you know, hundreds of milliseconds ago, and you're steering based on that. But, um, but sometimes you, you're not doing that based on the actual position, and then you realize you overjudged the, the situation, and so you, you know, turn, end up turning the steering wheel in the other direction. Or, we're very commonly operating based on our perceptions of the world. Typically, we are, and our perceptions have delays, and these have been measured physiologically. Um, but organizationally, we also have delays. So here, what I'm arguing is this bottom one is none other than our friend here, this top one, with x target being, instead of a fixed value, it's what? 
the actual value. So this bottom, this bottom set of flows in stock is just our target following thing where the actual value serves as the target and we're adjusting our perceived value to follow the target according to this delay. Does that make sense? So these, this bottom one is following the actual value. And in turn, the top one is adjusting, but it's adjusting the gap between the target and the perceived value, which is how we operate. And there's a whole area that Kurt Kruger got into through the august um, uh, guidance of none other than Jeff McDonald called perceptual control theory that's basically based on this. And the general perspective, as articulated by Pierce, or Purse, I think is, is how it was pronounced, uh, is that we make decisions in the world, whether institutionally or personally, not based on the actual situation, but based on the perceived situation. And if you understand, frame the world in that time, in that way, you can understand a lot of the mistakes that are made um, and a lot of the, uh, you know, the overshoots that happen with, with policy endeavors or a lot of the delayed actions on the policy front or the intervention front um, coming out of this and reason explicitly about how to lower perception delay. Um, for example, how could perception delays be lowered in, a, uh, in say, a health system? Yeah. But one thing that's close to our heart as technologists is technology. And, and actually certain types of information technology could turn delays from being a week or, or a month to being, you know, hours or minutes. It doesn't eliminate the delay, but it can make it, um, it, can, it can shorten it. Um, and it's one of the roles information technology plays in businesses is allowing real-time sort of updating of policy based on, on um, recent changes. So, uh, you know, information technology plays an important role within that area. And indeed, in the 1950s and 60s, when Jay Forrester formulated a lot of industrial dynamics, perception delay on the part of a company was often, you know, a, a quarter, like three months or a year at a time. And so they'd be making decisions based on recent sales over the last quarter. And that still goes on quite a bit. You get these reports coming out that summarize, you know, the performance of your sales teams over the last quarter, and you make your decisions based on investments, et cetera, and your strategy um, based on those somewhat outdated values. Okay, so when we have a system like this, what gives? What gives? Well, we talked about the behavior associated with a, a first order delay by itself. Behavior of first order delay, we illustrated just a minute ago, right? So in this very canvas, I had a first order delay, a target following first order delay, and you'll forgive the angular arrows in place, but as I adjust the target, X does what? It follows it, right? I, I, I move it up and X goes up to follow it. And in any logic, you could have fun and it would, you know, adjust the target partway through and it... Quai, quai, long ti tong. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll be. Um, so, so here it's following in any, any logic, you can adjust the target, it will, it will follow it accordingly, okay? Um, uh, even if you adjust the target over time, it will follow it. And you can have fun doing that, it's a lot of fun. Um, at least from my perspective. Um, this is the dynamics associated with that. It's the dynamics associated with a first order delay, right? You approach from either above or below some equilibrium value, right? Mm hmm? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, fair enough. And you know, if I wanted to, to take it in a negative direction, I could approach it from above, right? Um, if I started X at an, as an initial value of some you know, huge thing, maybe I 
I set this to be 5,000 initially. This might start to strike you as, as very familiar. There's your old friend. Look at him. Look at him. He's your first order delay friend, right? That, doesn't that look like a first order delay? Yeah. The other one is a first order delay with inflow. Yeah, um, it approaches some equilibrium value. Okay, so this will be if you're for that. What happens when we introduce these these sort of um, delays associated with perception? Anyone? What behavior do you think will result? It oscillates. It oscillates. It exhibits oscillation, ladies and gentlemen. There we. Oh, not that. What's that? That's a second order delay. Um, Here's the oscillation. Mm. So I'll, I'll open it up and we'll see it, okay? So, so here we go. Here we go to Vensim. Let's, let's, let's uh, get out of that, split that joint, and here we go. Um, ready? There you go. Here's, here's, for example, the actual value, and here's the perceived value. Oscillation. Why oscillations? You overshoot. You, you overshoot. Take a look at this gap between the delay and the actual. What do you notice? If I viewed the gap in that other one, if I viewed the gap, not, not to, to make this too pedantic, but if I viewed this gap here, what, what would I see? Hmm? What do I see? Okay, if I approach it from the negative side, it will, it will be coming up there negative. If I were to start this thing empty, as I am wont to do, there we go. This gap looks like that. In either case, what's happening? The gap is becoming, in terms of magnitude, the gap is becoming what? Smaller and smaller and smaller. It's successively getting more and more accurate. It's the state of the system is approaching our target closer and closer and closer, right? Do you see that? If you don't, exhibit A, okay? Do you see that? C or not? C. C. Thank you. Um, uh, by the way, in Spanish, that means yes. Um, so, uh, so is that the case in this system? That it approaches it closer and closer? Yeah. Monotonically, closer and closer? Is the magnitude of the gap becoming smaller and smaller uh, in magnitude? Is it getting... Is, is the difference between the target and what it's trying to get to getting smaller and smaller? No, no, um, no, it's not. And this is between target and perceived value. Let's let's actually look at the. I'm gonna. I hope this won't confuse you, but I'm gonna add on to this. I'm gonna layer on to this. Um, uh, you know, with uh, extra gap. I'm gonna say extra gap and I'm going to put in a gap just I'm going to do it between between the target and the actual value gap between target and actual value the idea here is that you actually don't see the actual value. like as the actor typically you don't see the actual value you can't see it instantaneously and react instantaneously to it but imagine if we for the sake of of just extending our understanding here Suppose we were to quantify how close is the actual value to the target. Do you think this is going to be monotonically decreasing, or, or you know, getting the magnitude of it will be monotonically decreasing? Okay, here we go. No, no. No. The target and the actual value is it getting? closer and closer we, we want to get there and and the actual value um, the actual value is varying over time target is staying at 10 and the gap actually 
starts getting worse initially, and then we get it smaller and smaller gap, but we overshoot, as Alex said, and then it starts, uh, you know, we, we overshoot, and so we go too far, and it's getting worse. We're getting more and more off between the target and the actual value, and then it's getting less. And part of it is we, we can't act based on the target value, the actual value here. And so, so it's not linearly uh, improving. And if we were to run this out and examine it in the fullness of time here, um, uh, let's run it out, shall we say 50? Are we okay with that? Hearing no objections, I'll run it out. Here we go. Mm. 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 So here, it's far from monotonically decreasing. You know, the gap, the gap sometimes gets worse, sometimes gets worse. Sorry? That's, oh, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, I was wondering about that. Okay, thank you. I should be, thank you. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. Okay, here we go. Here's the gap. Here's the gap between the target and the actual value, okay? Let, let's go see what the actual value is over time. Well, we just saw it, right? That's the actual value. Um, that approach is what? Approach is 10, approach is target. What is the perceived value? Approaches 10, 10, okay. So, so this, is, this is interesting. If this approach is 10, and that is 10, why is this, let's, let's just. I think it is approaching zero. I think, it, known obvious on the axis. I think that's right. Yeah, it's approaching zero. See this, it oscillates around zero. Negative and, and from the negative and positive direction, it's just, so it's you, just you get minus 5.5 yes this is this is approaching zero so it's it's eventually getting there but it oscillates in the meantime it oscillates in the meantime and sometimes it gets better it, it reduces the gap and sometimes it gets worse the gap gets larger just like you overcorrect when you're steering on ice and the car goes too far to one side and it's getting worse from where you want to go and then you steer the other way and it slides, you've gone too far. Okay, so this is our, our, our underlying situation. If we understand it in terms of both state variables, this is what it looks like. So here we have y and x. One of them is, uh, is, is the actual x and one of them is the perceived y. And they oscillate um, and, and continue to evolve. Okay, so that's, that's good. That's a very, um, uh, that's, that's a good situation. Now let's take a look at this from the Jacobian perspective. Um, well, we could, we could write out this, these equations. Maybe, maybe we will. What has to be adjusted here? If, if the delay is one in both cases, um, I'll get rid of that too. But what else has to be adjusted? Hmm? What else has to be adjusted? Is this y x anymore? No, it turns into y, right? Turns into y here. Um, there's a there's a y y component, um, and there's also a I think minus y over there, but but we get something like like this, okay? Um, and uh, if I could just be a little bit picky about where I write these things, I'll write it as minus y over one, right? If we take the Jacobian of it, what do you get? So remember what the Jacobian is, written here conveniently. So, so what's in the upper left? Zero, good. And what's in the, the, lower, the lower left? One. One, because it's partial f, which is f sub x, which is x, x uh, minus, minus y here. Um, uh, and partial x. The y doesn't change at all with respect to x, so the 
partial x takes that away, and all you get is one, right? How about the upper right? What is what is that? Yeah, minus one, because you're taking this with respect to partial y, and, and the bottom one, minus one. Yeah, and that's exactly what you get. That's the Jacobian here, okay? Um, and that Jacobian maps, if, if we put it down here in our picture, there we go. Hey, hello? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, okay, if we put it in our picture here, um, the further we go out in the x direction, what is that turning those x vectors into? So, sorry, we, we go out further in the x direction. The Jacobian, remember, maps for a linear system the vector, size of the vector, in this case from zero, because it's linear. So, so we're going further and further out in this x direction. And that's the Jacobian. If we apply it to a vector, we get out the rate of change, right, with respect to, to uh, x and y. And so as we go further and further in the x direction, what do we get out? We get out change that's further and further in the what direction? The y direction, right? Remember this? The idea of, of matrices as, 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 as operators here geometrically. The, if we have something that's purely 0, 1 and we multiply by it, what that serves to do, I'm oh, sorry, purely one zero. It's going x in the x direction, but none in the y direction. So it's one zero. All that serves to do, if we multiply this matrix by it, it picks out what? The first, the first column, which is zero one. And so what that's telling us is, as we have larger and larger values of the state in terms of the value of, of x, um, uh, so we're going further and further out here, what, what's happening is it's being turned into change because that's what Jacobia does. It says for a given state, give me the rate of change that results. All that change is, is in the y direction vertically. There's no change in the x direction. Do you see that? That's why it's zero. That's why we're picking out this first column. And this is the rate of change. It's the rate of change of x and the rate of change of y, right? That's what those two values are. So the rate of change of x is zero. And the rate of change of y is, is 1. That's why it's in the positive direction. So these things are going up here. Do you see that? As we go further and further out here, those things are going up. That's just the result of this first column. Now let's, let's think about what is it. So if we go in the y direction, if, if we consider increasing y here, what are we going to get out? We're going to get out change that's in what direction? We have purely y here. We're going to get out change in the, well, we're picking out, if we have a 0, 1, and we multiply it by this matrix, we pick out the what? The second column, right? We multiply this by 0, 1. Remember, for each row, 0 is going to be times the first one, right? It's just going to be 1 times the second. So it just picks out the second column. So what this is saying is the rate of change is in what direction? Mag negative x and negative y. So it's pointing down here. So the further we go up here, the, you know, you have the change in, in the negative direction. And any other vector is just a combination of these. It's just you know, a certain amount of this one and a certain amount of that one, which, gives, which explains all these ones in between. Right? Um, so for example, on, the, on the, uh, this line here, sort of the 45 degree line, we have the, the negative direction associated with being up that much y canceling out with the uh, positive y direction from being that far out x. And so all you're doing is you're going negative x direction. Does that make sense? And so, so we have this uh, matrix uh, operating on this. And, and this is the Jacobian directly dictates this. And what, what results is a spiral. You know, you can see the swirls here. You come out and you sort of go down here. And what's this point here in the middle? What's that point? That corresponds to the what? Equilibrium, Equilibrium point. It's being sucked in here. <laughs> Boom, right there. 
it, it gets sucked into that vortex, okay? Um, uh, and, and approaches that equilibrium point. Um, and uh, it may do so with you know, negative perception of, 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 of the situation, negative actual situation, but it spirals in and approaches that viewpoint. And if you were to change the delay, you would see um, different speeds of convergence. But you'll notice time is not written here. We don't actually see how fast we're going at different times or how, how, uh, how slow we're going. Um, would that, yeah. Would that mean oh. that if you simply scale, if you change the delay and you scale this, um, uh, this graph here, would be the equivalent graph, like regardless of the delay? Um, or does the shape change? Good, good question. Um, I have my intuition that we would see basically the same, a, a very similar general shape, but I think some of the particulars of it would change. And in particular, I think the number of iterations before it starts to obviously settle down could be different. Because if there's a very long delay associated with perception compared to action, let, let's, let's go play with it here, right? Here we go. Here, here's Vensim. And I'm going to change the perception delay to one, from one mm -hmm. to, to something more. Okay, you can start to see. Now take a look at the actual value. It's oscillating more. And that's going to correspond to more spirals around that x-axis before it settles down. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with a very outdated situation, or understanding of the situation. So we're making changes that overshoot and undershoot a lot because we're dealing with this very old perception rather than a new one. And we end up sort of only slowly approaching our, our target. Does that make sense? Or, or you know, the situation where the, the actual value equals the target. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is a, a state space sort of portrait of that that we see here. And, um, and we see it actually as fairly complex structure, but we can tease it apart in terms of, you know, reasoning about, about the Jacobian. But next time we're going to come back to this issue. By the way, this is it with uh, a zero, uh, zero target. Okay. Um, next time we're going to come back to this, um, uh, to this system with uh, a decoupling idea in mind. And we'll see that that whilst this seems tightly coupled, we can actually represent it in a totally decoupled way um, with, uh, with another, another system um, in a way that, that just two things um, oscillating on their own. But we can only do that for that system if we have recourse to, uh, to, to values which are in the complex uh, complex point that are not merely reals. By contrast, some systems we can decouple occasion, you know, completely and, uh, and have a system which oscillates with each thing completely separate from the other purely with, uh, with real numbers associated with it. Anyway, we'll see this uh, some next time and we'll talk about uh, uh, the nonlinear um, uh, components of this as well. Okay, thanks very much. And we'll, oh, we'll have to see how, when you read these graphs with the nonlinear context, you're no longer going to be able to just do reason about this matrix in the distance from the origin. Instead, you'll be reasoning about this distance, how the Jacobian acts in the regions around what? Begins with an E, sorry? Equilibria or critical points, or fixed points, you use different terms, points of balance. Because there, the, the constant term associated with F uh, will be zero, the system will be in balance, and it's really how does the matrix operate in that region around there. And that matrix, the Jacobian matrix, for a nonlinear system, will the Jacobian matrix be a fixed set of values like it is, um, uh, like it is here, like this Jacobian matrix? No, for a nonlinear system, 
this Jacobian will, in general, depend on what? State of the system. It'll include things like X and Y in this case, which means that the shape of that matrix, its entries will be different in different regions of this plane. And around different equilibria, it will be different in its actions. It'll have different actions. And some of them will be stable, They'll like suck things in from around it, and a perturbation will just still out to suck it in, and others will be unstable, and it will sort of spit things out um, and, and sort of shoot it out. And a, and a small deviation at equilibrium will be perfectly in balance, but if you go off slightly in any direction, it'll be like, you know, a population that's never seen measles before has no vaccinations. You bring in one person with measles and all hell breaks loose. So, you know, it starts spreading and the number of people with measles grows uh, exponentially. And that's what will happen with some equilibria um, uh, in, in nonlinear systems. They'll be associated with this exponential takeoff if you go even a little bit out of the equilibrium. But as long as there's no one sick, as long as this is, then the system's in balance and it's stable. But just a little bit going off the edge, it will, uh, it will fly out of control. Okay, um, so just as this, it's in equilibrium, but a slight perturbation, it'll accelerate away in a <coughs> metastable state. Okay, um, it'll be better this way. There we go. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I close this lecture. Thank you.